Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about one of these questions that comes up all the time in the lifting world, the fitness world, and, and really it's a question that we shouldn't be asking because the truth is the, the question itself and the answer to it has no bearing whatsoever on what we should actually be doing. And that is the question of how much protein can we actually use towards building new muscle tissue every day. And a lot of people say, well, well, Jason, I mean, it's obvious we're eating more protein so we can build more muscle. But that's not actually why you're eating more protein. You might think that's why it is. But the truth is, if you start extrapolating the math out and you say, okay, I think that I'm no longer a novice lifter and I can build a pound, a pound of muscle, right, every single month, an entire pound. Well, what is that, about 400 grams? About 400 grams. Well, the problem is that most of that is water. Right? Most of that is water. At least 80% of that is water and glycogen and everything else. And, I, and I'm actually being uh, inaccurate in that. It's a, more of it's water and glycogen than it is 80%. But even if you called it 80%, you would say, okay, I can add, in that case, maybe, maybe 80 maybe 80 grams of actual new tissue proteins to my body every single month. Well, what is that? Two and a half, three grams at the most per day? So, so what you're saying with I want to gain a pound of muscle a month is that that's about three grams of protein. About three grams of protein. If we were consuming protein purely for the purpose of gaining maximum muscle because we're using the protein we're eating, to build new muscle tissue, you could just eat the RDA. You would never need to even think about protein intake. It would be completely irrelevant, wouldn't it? Because you can only use a few grams, right? And even then, you go take a rank novice, somebody who's making total new gains. What, about five grams of protein a day can go towards that? So we'd look over at the RDA and say, I don't know, 60 grams. That's what you're supposed to consume for basic metabolic functions, right? About 60 grams of protein a day. Add five to that, 65 grams. Now, has there ever been any studies we've looked at where we found people gained maximum muscle on 65 grams? No. Do we usually find data showing that people gain muscle when they start going way above that, double that, triple that? Yeah, we do. We do. But that's also relative to what their training programs look like. We're not consuming large amounts of protein because we think we're going to build it into muscle tissue. We're doing it for metabolic reasons. We're doing it for recovery reasons. We're doing it for satiety, thermic effect, energy turnover. Hey, that's, that's why we're doing it. Because by that same token, when you go look at protein overfeeding studies, what happens? People don't gain any fat. Right? Protein is essentially like a buffer against fat gain. In other words, when you look at protein overfeeding studies, what happens? Well, you can take people who are at maintenance calories, carefully tracked maintenance, and you put them in a lab and you have them weight train and you have them add 400 or 500 calories of extra protein to their diet every day while still consuming the same carbs and fat, non-protein calories, right? People who are just at, you know, something like that, 150 grams of protein. And then you have them add... 150 more grams of protein, you know, 300 grams of protein and stuff like that, 350, while keeping carbs and fat the same. Now, if you followed basic rules of thermodynamics, you would think, aha, well, they're going to gain weight because they've, they've added another 500 calories to their diet. But they don't. They don't gain any body fat. So what some of the protein overfeeding studies would suggest to us that our maintenance calories in terms of maintaining body weight and body fat changes should be largely calculated upon our non-protein calories. Because protein doesn't contribute to fat gain even when it's overfed. So what does that tell you? Well, the people who are trying to gain muscle mass or recomposition, if they're eating much higher protein, can eat more calories. Well, people say, well, there's no point though. If you're not necessarily gaining muscle from that, 
but you're not gaining fat. It's just basically free calories. Well, it would sound that way at first till you realize, number one, there's a satiety issue, but number two, there's an energy turnover and recovery issue. Because consuming that protein, we still utilize it. It has a thermic effect. It has a hormonal effect in terms of everything from IGF-1 to all these other things happening in the body. And if you're training pretty lazily, it might not matter. But what happens when we go to really high volumes of training? Well, some of that could facilitate better recovery. Well, what about when we stop looking at just muscle tissue recovery? It's one of the things every lifter notices, and a lot of coaches who work with middle-aged type lifters notice this. When someone starts to get tendons that hurt, what's usually the, one of the things that helps increase their animal source protein. Why? Because we absorb it better. Now people say, well, what, does it matter if it's animal source? Yes, it matters. You don't absorb plant protein efficiently. Yeah, there's a reason if people go vegan why they have to have 400 grams of protein in the form of shakes and stuff to make good muscle progress. Like what I would consider good progress, not what a lot of vegans consider. You don't absorb it. Animal source protein is far more bioavailable, but what happens with that? Well, we notice that their connective tissue and stuff heals quicker. We get less tendonitis. We get less tendonitis. In other words, we're dealing with some other recovery factors. We're dealing with additional recovery. And I mean, if you guys have looked, you've seen people like Alan Aragon, who's discussed this a lot, um, has looked at the safety end of it. There doesn't seem to be health risks at all. This whole idea of it is bad for people who have healthy kidneys and stuff already to eat large amounts of protein doesn't seem to be true. Even with protein overfeeding. There's not really health risks associated with it. And there's not health risks associated with it. And there can be recovery benefits, particularly when we step away from just thinking in terms of muscle recovery. We start looking at things like connective tissue. Or we start looking at really high volumes of training. Well, what do we know about really high volumes of training? They produce better muscle growth, but only in so much as you can recover from them. Well, that's what you start finding more and more. People who train with very high volumes of training recover better as protein goes up. So the benefits become very, very minor, but in the context of perfect programming, they seem to be real. And again, the protein overfeeding itself is a buffer against fat gain. So people who are just pursuing body composition, it's a buffer against fat gain. Even when you create a calorie surplus, it allows for better connective tissue recovery and things which is what our biggest concern is when training volumes go up. So for someone who's really trying to, to kind of pursue all these benefits, it makes sense to protein overfeed. Way beyond any concept of, of what you would be consuming to gain muscle. Now the downside, this is where we run into practicality. So when people ask me, how much protein should I be consuming? Well, what does your budget and palate allow for? That's your upper threshold. Hey, based upon all that data, I would say there are small benefits and no real negatives to protein overfeeding. The only negatives are to your pocketbook. So I'm not telling you to go buy protein supplements, because that's the other thing. This sort of data is sometimes used to drive supplement sales. I'm not telling you to buy supplements. I'm telling you from food, deep, high-protein foods. If you can afford it and you enjoy eating it and there's no negatives to your palate and it doesn't hurt your budget... That's your upper threshold for your protein intake. If you won't miss the money you spend on it, and you're not having to force feed yourself, adding another 100 grams of protein from wherever you are might have minor benefits. Might have minor benefits, particularly for the people like me who are heavy overeaters. We eat a lot high appetite people. Combine that with the satiety benefits, it's a good way to recomposition. Okay. There's no upper threshold. The upper threshold is a practical threshold. How much protein can you stand to consume? How much can you afford without having to spend money on a bunch of UV supplements and support that industry? That's your upper threshold. Okay. It's not about how much you can use to build muscle directly because that's actually such a tiny amount that you would never even need to track it. So from a practical perspective, there are other considerations that matter a lot more. That's what we should be looking at. 
All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.